Good evening, everybody. It's good to have you back at Mesa Baptist Church tonight for our Wednesday night service. We're so glad you're here. Back in James chapter 5 in just a few moments. So let's all stand if we can this evening. Begin our service with number 618. Stand up, stand up for Jesus. Let's all stand up, stand up tonight. Number 618 on that first verse, nice and loud. Stand up, stand up for Jesus, ye soldiers of the cross. Lift high his royal banner, it must not suffer loss. From victory unto victory, his army shall he lead. Till every foe is vanquished, and Christ is Lord indeed. Stand up, stand up for Jesus, the trumpet call obey. Forth to the mighty conflict, in this his glorious day. Ye that are men now serve him against unnumbered foes. Let courage rise with danger and strength to strength up on this last. Stand up, stand up for Jesus, the strife will not be long. This day the noise of battle, the next the victor's song. To him that overcometh a crown of life shall be. He with the King of glory shall reign eternally. All right, not too bad on a Wednesday night. Let's go to number 625. Faith is the victory that overcomes the world. Number 625 on this first verse. Nice and loud together. Encamped along the hills of light, ye Christian soldiers rise and press the battle ere the night shall veil the glowing skies. Against the foe in veils below, let all our strength be hurled. Faith is the victory we know that overcomes the world. Faith is the victory, faith is the victory. Oh, glorious victory that overcomes the... Let's have this one play through a few times tonight. Let's get around and shake hands this evening. Thanks so much for being in church tonight. To our seats tonight. Hey, Dan. Let's make our way back to our seats tonight. Number 625 on this second verse together. His banner over us is love, our sword, the word of God. We tread the road, the saints above, with shouts of triumph trod. By faith they like our ward, one's breath swept over every field. The faith by which they conquered death is still our shining shield. Faith is the victory, faith is the victory, oh glorious victory that overcomes the world. On this last verse together. 
to him who overcomes the foe white raiment shall be given before the angels he shall know his name confessed in heaven then onward from the hills of light our hearts with love aflame will vanquish all the hosts of night caught you sleeping in jesus concrete name faith is the victory faith is the victory oh glorious victory that overcomes the world amen great singing tonight you may be seated we're glad you're here this evening appreciate you singing out and uh, just a few quick announcements to make and then if you did not get a prayer list let me encourage you to go back to the lobby and get one um, so you can follow along with our uh, prayer time this afternoon and also after the end of the service you can pray accordingly and specifically for some of the things we have going on this week and uh, for the requests that were turned in on Sunday. And I want to make sure we're always faithful in praying for these requests every day if we can. And so if you need a prayer time, you can go back to the lobby and grab one. Uh, but before we jump into the prayer time, just a few quick announcements. Um, we're <clears throat> still busy here at the church. Got a lot coming up and a lot going on right now. This coming Sunday is the 29th. The 30th is Memorial Day, so you might have plans for Memorial Day. And so what we're going to do on the 29th, that's this coming Sunday night, is we're going to have a fellowship after the service on Sunday evening, if you want to stay. Um, we're just going to put some hamburgers and hot dogs on the grill, have some potato salad and chips and pop. Um, and then we're going to set the volleyball nets up outside and also have some cornhole and that ladder stuff in the, the yards. And so if you want to bring some board games Sunday night as well, um, we'll have a good time. You can play outside or play inside. And so that'll be after this evening service this coming Sunday night. Um, Dominic is preaching this evening, so he'll do a good job on that. And so I told him, don't go too long, all right? And so we're going to throw some burgers and fries out there, or burgers and dogs out on the grill. And so that'll just be whenever the service ends on Sunday. And so we'd love to have you stay Sunday night. And if you don't want to play volleyball or cornhole outside, then bring some board games and play inside. Let's have a good time together as a church family. As I love getting the church family together for fellowship. And so it's always a good time to hang out. And so that's on Sunday the 29th. That's this coming Sunday, so we'd love to have you. And if you want to help grill burgers and dogs, let me know after the service. Uh, we got two uh, grills, and so we got plenty of room out there. So if you want to help grill that out. Hey, Dan, I see you. It's good to see you. Oh, you're a volunteer. I thought you were saying, hey. I'm like, hey, Dan, it's good to see you this evening. Amen. It's good to have Dan in service tonight. Amen. You know, he was in the hospital on Sunday night and Monday, had a surgery on. Your surgery was Monday or Tuesday? It was Monday. Yeah, so from Sunday to Wednesday, he's been in and out of the hospital. But it's good to see you here this evening. So appreciate you making it. So I wave back. Oh, you're volunteering. Okay. Anybody want to work with Dan? I know it's a, a big task. All right, Chris. All right, anybody else? One more person. Any other Chris? All right. Easy enough. That's fair. All right, the back row Baptist back there. Dan over here, Chris back there, and Chris over here. Okay. So uh, after the service, we'll throw the hot dogs and hamburgers out there, and the church will buy all the, the macaroni salad or potato salad or chips. You don't have to bring anything. Just bring a game if you want to to play inside. All right, and so uh, we should have our Romeos versus our, uh, no, never mind. Okay, so, uh, so volleyball outside, like cornhole outside, if I want to play inside, bring some board games. We'll have a good time with that on Sunday night. And then on uh, Friday the, th the 3rd, that's June the 3rd, next Friday, um, Melvin's graveside service is going to be at 2.30 at um, the funeral home. I'll put the information for that in the bulletin. The cemetery, that's right. Yeah, at 2.30 at the cemetery. It's, it begins at 2.30, so if we get there a little earlier, and uh, we're kind of on a time constraint there, so I want to make sure we start right on time at 2.30, so if we could be there a little after 2, uh, around 2.15, it would be great. And that's at 2.30 at the, at the cemetery on the 3rd. The information will be in the bulletin on Sunday. And then Elizabeth's graduation party is at 7 o'clock on that same night, the 3rd. And so if you want to be here at the church, that's just cake and punch, so if you want to stop by the church and I wish her congratulations and uh, let her know how proud you are of her. I know she'd appreciate that. And the following week is our missions trip, and so that's really right around the corner now. Um, that's, we're leaving on the 7th. We got the vans today, so we rented four vans, um, so four minivans. And so we got the tickets, we got the hotel, we got the vans, so everything's set. We just got to show up and be there. And so just keep praying, hopefully every day, um, for our missions team, that God keeps us healthy and safe and free from any kind of injury. And so that's the 7th through the 14th. The week after that is Father's Day the 19th, a very special Sunday there. Uh, Dominic's preaching again in the evening service then, and then the very next week after that, the 26th, uh, which we're having an ensemble in, Fairhaven Baptist College asked if they could come in and sing for us all day on the 26th, 
And so um, their dean of students will be preaching in the morning service, and I'll be preaching in the evening service to show them how it's done. And so they're going to be preaching. I'm just kidding. Some of you are paying attention. All right. And so he'll be preaching in the morning service. I'll be preaching in the evening service. But they're singing all day, the ensemble. About eight or nine of them singing. So that'll be a lot of fun. That's the 26th. And uh, the week after that's teen camp. And so, oh, and that night is the bake auction. And so we have a lot of stuff next week, like something every week for the next six weeks or so. And so just make sure you're mindful of that. Keep your bulletin handy so you don't miss anything. Just pray for all the events coming up that we don't forget anything, all right, or forget about anything. And this that we have really good turnout for everything. And just good to have time together as a church family throughout the summer. All right. Um, let's pray for the Herndons this week. They are a missionary family of the week. And so their email address was in the bulletin. So if you want to send them a quick email, I know they would appreciate that. Let them know you're praying for him. And let him know specifically how you're praying for them. And then uh, just a few quick announcements to add. Uh, let's pray. Jackie Hernandez reminded us, but we want to make sure we mention the families in Texas um, after the elementary school shooting this week. Um, it's such a travesty and tragedy. Yes, ma'am. No, ma'am. I think it's next week. Yeah, I think it's the f- third or fourth. 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 So nine to three. <clears throat> yeah, so let's pray for the families in Texas after that, um, the school shooting there. Um, it's such a, a difficult time for them, I'm sure. And so uh, let's pray for them. And then uh, let's also pray for Melvin's graveside service, that the Lord will be honored in that. There may be some of his friends there. And uh, so make sure we preach the gospel once again, and I'll let the Lord be glorified through that all. Anybody else this evening want to add anything to our prayer list? Let's start on this side this evening. Anybody want to add anything this evening from this side of the auditorium? Add anything to our prayer requests or praises this evening? How about this right center section? Anybody want anything? Yes, Miss Barbara in the back. Yeah, I thought it was going to rain the other day. It started sprinkling. I was like, here we go, and it didn't last long. So we'll pray for that, and also, yeah, we'll pray for those requests for sure. Thanks, Barbara. I'm glad you're here tonight. Uh, did somebody on the far right side have a... Don. I was just going to do a praise that it was 12 years I've been saved on Monday. Amen. Amen. Saved 12 years this past Monday, huh? Praise the Lord. We're so glad you're here at Mesa Baptist Church. You're a blessing. So amen. What a big praise that is. Amen. Anybody else in this center section here? Pastor Carr? Yes, Tim Wolfbrantz, he's up there uh, fighting the fires with the National Guard. He was called out a couple weeks ago. And so putting in long hours up there. So we'll pray for him. Thanks for the reminder. Yeah, pray for him and his family for sure. All right, anybody else in this half of the auditorium? Miss Tish? I just want to pray for my son. Okay, let's pray for Miss Tish's son. We'll pray for him tonight. Absolutely, Miss Tish's son. Tim? Oh, okay. Okay, we'll pray for Sean, for sure. All right, anybody else on the right side? All right, how about this left center section? Anybody in this section here? Miss Lori? for your chemical stress test tomorrow. Okay. Thank you. We'll pray for that this evening. Anybody else in this section here? Miss Roseanne?
Okay. All right, we'll pray for Joey then, one of Tim's co-workers who's struggling with some things. All right. Anybody else? How about in this far left section here? Brother Joe. Okay. We'll pray for Dana. She's not feeling well tonight. Yes, ma'am, Miss Cheryl. Okay. Thanks for watching, Andrew. We'll pray for heat. You said Ukraine? Okay. You don't hear much about that anymore. We'll pray for the people in Ukraine for sure. Matter of fact, my wife and I were just talking about that for church. All right. Good to see you, Andrew. Zoom in real close during the message so he pays attention. All right. Anybody else in this far left section? All right. If that's it, then uh, let's. Yes, ma'am. Yeah. Okay. Let's pray for Maurice Moffat. Um, Lord, really, Lord, will get his heart and I bring him back to church. All right. Anybody else this evening? Okay. If that's it, then um, after the service this evening, for about 10 minutes, we'll pray for these requests that were turned in on Sunday and the ones that were added this evening. And uh, I appreciate you being so faithful in praying for those. And let's also not forget to pray for the Herndons this evening as they're ministering here in New Mexico. All right. Let's all stand one more time tonight. Number 198. He abides. He abides. We'll sing that first, second, and last verse together. This might still be a new one for some people. If you know it, sing it out. If not, we'll learn it together this evening on this first verse. I'm rejoicing night and day as I walk the narrow way For the hand of God in all my life I see And the reason of my bliss, yes, the secret all is this That the Comforter abides with me He abides, He abides Hallelujah, He abides with me I'm rejoicing night and day as I walk the narrow way For the Comforter abides with me Once my heart was full of sin Once I had no peace within Till I heard how Jesus died upon the tree Then I fell down at His feet And there came a peace so sweet Now the Comforter abides with me he abides, He abides, hallelujah, He abides with me. I'm rejoicing night and day as I walk the narrow way, for the Comforter abides with me. There's no thirsting for the things of the world, they've taken wings. Long ago I gave them up and instantly all my night was turned to day, all my burdens rolled away. Now the Comforter abides with me. He abides, He abides, hallelujah, He abides with me. I'm rejoicing night and day as I walk the narrow way, for the Comforter abides with me. Amen. Great singing. Thanks for standing. You may be seated tonight. Let's go to James chapter 5 for our text this evening. James chapter 5. We mentioned the missions trip earlier. And uh, we'll be gone for a week, Tuesday to Tuesday. And so we're grateful that the Lord has provided some good pastors uh, to fill in for us. Uh, on Wednesday that we're gone, uh, Brother Esteban Montoya will be preaching uh, that 8th, I believe, that Wednesday the 8th. And then that Sunday... Brother Butch is preaching Sunday school. Pastor Carr is back behind the pulpit um, on Sunday morning. And then Pastor Brian Pyatt from Edgewood is preaching the evening service. And so let's begin praying for them, that the Lord will give them the right words to say and be an encouragement to our church family. All right, James chapter 5, verse 13 through 16 will be our text tonight. James 5, 13 through 16. And uh, once again, our series of the book of James is mirroring what we're learning on Sundays in the Sermon on the Mount. And it's been amazing to me as God has overlapped uh, a lot of these thoughts and topics that we've been covering, three chapters in Matthew and five chapters in James, we have the Holy Spirit keeps bringing some of these things back to our minds. And not because we're applying it that way, but because they're dealing with these topics at the same time we're learning them. And once again, we're looking at the idea of prayer, but we're going to look at a different facet of prayer this evening. The Bible says in James chapter 5 and verse 13, <clears throat> the Bible says in James 5, 13, Is any among you afflicted? Let him pray. Is any merry? Let him sing psalms. Is any sick among you? 
Let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of the faith shall save the sick, and the Lord shall raise him up. And if he hath committed sins, they shall be forgiven him. Confess your faults one to another, and pray one for another, that ye may be healed. The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. The Bible says in Matthew chapter 6 in the Sermon on the Mount, it tells us how we ought to pray. And we ought to pray without much speaking, and we ought to pray without vain repetition. And at that same time, we were learning from James chapter 1, how if we lack wisdom, we ask of God, who giveth to all men liberally, and upbraideth not. So anything you need from the Lord, He will provide for you. And so God will give you wisdom. We pray back to Him without vain repetition, without much speaking. Matthew chapter 6, verses 9 through 13, we learned how to pray with the acrostic acts, adoration, confession, thanksgiving, and supplication. Near that same time, we were in James chapter 4, when we learned that we have not because we ask not. Then back in Matthew chapter 7, the Lord taught us why we ought to pray. We ask, so it is given. We seek and we knock. And now this evening, we're looking at if you're sick, you can pray and be anointed. And so it seems like the Lord, as well as the apostles, they're both very interested and invested in our prayer life. And I'm grateful that Jesus does not just remind us of the importance of prayer, but he teaches us to pray. I think it's Luke 18, verse 1, or right around there, when the, the apostles asked the Lord, the disciples said, Lord, teach us to pray. And so Jesus does just that. He starts with the heart and how we have to be humble and how we have to keep ourselves dependent on him. And the Lord teaches us how to pray and what to pray for and when to pray. And not really the posture physically, how to pray, but the posture of our heart, how to pray to the Lord. And here we see once again another facet of our prayer life, that when they're sick, there are those who can be anointed. Now we're going to talk about that this evening. Samuel Chadwick has a great quote on prayer. You're going to see it again on Sunday in the bulletin. He says, Satan dreads nothing but prayer. His one concern is to keep the saints from praying. He fears nothing from prayerless study, prayerless work, prayerless religion. He laughs at our toil. He mocks our wisdom, but he trembles when we pray. And so this evening, I want to look at why we pray and really the posture of our heart when we pray and what happens when we pray, all from Matt, uh, James chapter 5, 13 through 16. The Bible says, first of all, very clearly and very, uh, very quickly in verse 13, is any among you afflicted? The word afflicted there undergoing a hardship, enduring some kind of trouble. We've all been there before. Um, if you have felt like you've been going through the fire or the ringer, per se, that's kind of the idea here. So if you've been going through hardship, if you're going through trouble, James's recommendation is let him pray. Why do we pray? Because the Bible says in Psalm 34 and verse 4, I sought the Lord and he heard me and delivered me from all my fears. Psalm 34 verse 6. This poor man cried, and the Lord heard him and saved him out of all his troubles. Psalm 34, 17. The righteous cry, and the Lord heareth, and deliver them out of all their troubles. Psalm 34, 19. Many are the afflicted of the righteous, but the Lord delivereth him out of them all. And so Psalm 34, 4, 6, 17, and 19, the Bible reminds us to take our burdens to the Lord, because the Lord can deliver us from them all. And so is any afflicted? Pray. Is any merry, he says in verse uh, 13. Is any merry, is any happy, joyful, having a spirit of joy, let him sing psalms. You see, this is really the season of life, isn't it? Sometimes we go through bad times and hardships, and then we come back up and there's times of joy and great, great uh, uh, praise, and then we go back down to the hard times and afflictions and back up to times of joy, and that's kind of where we're at. James says there are some who are afflicted, and there's some who are merry. If you're afflicted, pray. And if you're joyful, then praise. Why do we praise? Well, I think we should praise the Lord because that directs our prayer to God. And we sing psalms. Psalms are hymns of praise and worship that are directed to God himself. And I think one of the reasons it's important for us to praise when we have these good times. Because all of us, we're on our knees and we're praying and we have that effectual, fervent prayer when we're in the times of affliction, when we're looking for God to answer, when we're looking for God to do something. We really need his help. We're really praying. But then when we break through that darkness, God finally answers and we get that joy back. 
it's then that our prayers oftentimes slow down or even stop altogether. When you need him, you're really invested and you're really praying. But when he answers and things are good, you really don't need him, so you don't talk to him too much. It's important for us to praise the Lord because that keeps us dependent on him. We don't get full of ourselves. We continue to rely on God, not just in the bad times, but also in the good times. If you're afflicted, pray. If you're merry, sing psalms. And then he asks in verse 14, is any sick among you? Is any sick? That's a physical affliction, some form of weakness, some form of feebleness. And it's interesting that sometimes the feebleness and weakness physically leads to a weakness and feebleness spiritually. I'm not sure if you've ever been so sick, you started, you started to lose heart and get discouraged You've been so ill physically that you began to doubt things spiritually. And that's kind of what we're talking about here this evening in this topic here. Is any sick and just not just like someone has a sniffles, you know, oh, man, I'm sick. I've got to call the elders of the church, you know. No, I mean, these are people who are like bedridden. They're really feeble. They're very weak. And uh, there's not much to do for them in a way. And so it's a, it's a weakness there physically. And sometimes that leads to weakness spiritually. And the Bible says, let them call for the elders and have them pray over him and anoint him with oil in the name of the Lord. And so we see the conditions of life in a way, those who are afflicted, those who are married, those who are sick. And then we see a call to action, a call to action. If anybody's sick, let him call in verse 14. I want you to follow along tonight because this is very important for us to learn this evening. Some very practical steps. Is any sick among you in verse 14? Let him call for the elders of the church. And let them, the elders, pray over him that is sick, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of the faith shall save the sick, and the Lord shall raise him up. And if he hath committed sins, they shall be forgiven him. We see several things here. We see some prayer, then we see anointing, then we see um, uh, forgiveness, we see uh, healing. And so there's a lot of topics here I want to cover, but... Um, the idea of anointing here is often misused by false teachers. And this idea of anointing is often used by televangelists or, or people who are just knowingly misrepresenting the gospel to garner emotion and probably even finances. Uh, they tell you to bring your sickness to the church and you'll be anointed and healed. Uh, you bring some money if it's a televangelist and we're gonna, we got the special oil. We'll put it on you and we'll pray over you and then you can be healed. And maybe you've seen some of these services either in person or on television where they say, we're going to have anointing service tonight and we're going to anoint the sick and we're going to anoint those who are afflicted and they will be healed because of our anointing. And that is a gross misrepresentation of what the Bible teaches. I even believe there is an element of demonic, uh, demonic oppression or, or demonism involved in some of that. Um, and so we have to understand really what we're talking about here this evening with this sickness and this anointing. So before we jump into the anointing, I want to talk, first of all, about the sickness. So we're going to do kind of like, think, imagine a tree in your mind. you got the trunk, and then it branches out at the top. That's what we're going to do a little bit with the idea of sickness in the Bible. We're going to start with some basic general truths, and then we're going to branch out some specific thoughts about sickness this evening. First of all, we think about everything going down to sickness, the, the root, per se, of sickness. All sickness, in a general sense, is because of man's sin. There was no sickness before the fall. There was no sickness when God created the world in Genesis chapter 1 and 2. The Bible says that Jesus or God made everything and it was very good. Disease and sickness and oppression was only introduced after man's sin. Because of man's sin, we now live in a world that is cursed by the curse of sin. And because of sin, we have all difficulty, all sickness, all disease, and ultimately all physical death. Now remember, just because all sickness in general is caused because of man's sin, that does not mean that whenever someone is sick, it's a judgment of God because of their sin. In general, we have sickness because of sin, but when somebody is sick, it's not a judgment by God for their sin. You know, sometimes it's just poor choices that we make. This is where Job's friends fell far short from being comforters. Uh, They thought Job was in this terrible predicament because of his sin. And God corrected them later in the book of Job. Job did not sin. Uh, Job was just going through something that God was allowing. And so 
the trunk per se, every, a general term. Sickness in general is because of sin. We have sin because of man's, we have sickness because of man's sin. Moving on from there, sickness can be caused by some specific sin or foolish choice. Sin can be caused by some specific sin or foolish choice. Maybe you know someone who has lung cancer. And they have lung cancer not because why does God allow these bad things to happen to such good people. Maybe he allowed that to happen because they've been smoking since they were 22 years old. And now they're paying the price for those bad decisions. There might be some people whose body um, has to fight off a lot of sexual diseases because of sexual promiscuity before they got saved. Uh, those things do not go away. And so the sickness they face now is because of sin from the past. Uh, poor health choices causes sickness and things like that. And so if you're feeling sick, it may not be because of sin. It may just be because of some poor choices that you are making or have made. And so sickness in general is because of sin, but some sickness is caused by specific or foolish choices. Now, moving on from that, now we're going to start to branch off. Sometimes God allows believers to suffer sickness so that they can glorify God. Sometimes we're sick because God wants to bring something to us so he can work in us, or he wants to work in somebody else through us, which means it's not always God's will for somebody to be healed of their sickness. Now, that's an interesting thought that we don't always think about, because when somebody gets sick, the first thing we do is we begin praying for them to be healed. But God's will is not for everyone to be healed all of the time. God may be working in their life for something specific, or he's trying to work in somebody else's life through their sickness. This also is the story of Job. God allowed Satan to touch and afflict Job so that Job would be a testimony for the glory of God. God knew that Job would respond in such a way that his testimony would come forth as gold. And even today we talk about the patience of Job and the faith that he had in the Lord. And so God allows believers to suffer sickness so that they can glorify God. Another branch, it's not God's will for everyone who is sick to be healed. We know there are believers who suffered trouble, but God did not heal them. They were not delivered from that affliction or that sickness. I think in your mind and mine, we all automatically go to the Apostle Paul. You know, three times he asked the Lord to deliver him of his affliction. That thorn in the flesh, he called it. It could have been an eye disease. We don't know specifically what it was. Probably an eye disease, but whatever it was, it was a hindrance to, to Paul, he felt, in the ministry. And so he said that he besought the Lord three times to remove that. And three times God said no. Why wouldn't God heal him? God is in the business of healing. He is the great physician. Well, because God was trying to remind Paul that through his weakness, he is strong. Amen. And that God's grace is sufficient for him. Sometimes people need to be sick in God's wisdom to keep them humble and to keep their focus. There was um, a man, oh, Pastor Carl, what was his name? The guy who had, uh, he was the evangelist, white hair, he's blind, he had the camp. And he got a real bad sickness. John something. I forget his name. All right. Anyway, um, it was, he was an evangelist. He had a great, a great camp. And uh, he got, it wasn't MS, but it was some kind of a, a disease. that uh, he, he lost all of his memory. When he got, woke up in the hospital, he had to learn how to walk again, how to talk again. They had to reintroduce him to his wife. He's like, what's a wife? You know, and so he had to re, uh, introduce him to his wife. John Bishop, that's right, John Bishop, was a great man. Thank you, Mrs. Carr, we're glad you're here tonight. All right, and so uh, uh, look up him online. He's a, he's a great testimony for the goodness of God. And so he had, he had to learn all of these motor skills again, and uh, he just learned about his wife and his relationship with the Lord again. It was, he's got such a joy. And he said sometimes he has these crippling migraines that literally, I mean, it drives him to the ground. He, he can't even stand up. It's just so painful. His body is so painful that he can't get out of bed sometimes, just lays there. And he said he was thinking one time, he, he had this really bad migraine. His head was, he felt just about to explode. And while he's telling the story, he's got glasses on because he's legally blind. He really can't see and he doesn't talk very well because he doesn't put the words in the right order all the time because of uh, how the sickness has affected his brain. But he's really interesting to listen to. And he said, I had this really bad migraine. I was in so much pain and I was on my knees with my hands on the bed, just like gripping the comforter. And then I realized 
what a blessing the sickness is that I have something that drives me to my knees every day. And I thought, I don't think I would have that perspective if I had his, the sickness or disease. Um, but in his mind, he was just, just really relying on God's strength and God's goodness. Uh, sometimes it is not God's will for people to be healed. Um, it's not God's will for everyone to be healed from their sickness. Um, another thought this evening, another branch per se, a lack of healing in someone's life is not indicative to a lack of faith. A lack of healing is not indicative to a lack of faith. This is a major way that the so-called faith healers rep- misrepresent God and they twist scriptures by putting the burden of healing back on the person who needs the healing. You know, they say, hey, listen, you come to church and pay your money and then come to church and then you can stand in line and maybe you'll be blessed by the presence of bishop or pastor or, or so-and-so and they'll wave their hanky or their, their suit coat over you or they'll pray over you or they'll put their hands on your head and they'll heal you. And so this really great emotional service, and then they smack you in the head. Maybe you fall back, and then you get up, and you're still sick. Or you still can't walk. Oh, it's not because I didn't do my job. I'm a faith healer. You didn't have enough faith, right? And so now you got to give us money again and come back tomorrow night, and we'll try it again. Well, just because someone's not healed is not indicative of lack of faith. That's not the case. Paul asked the Lord three times to remove his thorn, and God said no each time. Another thing we can think about this evening as we hurry on to this idea of anointing is oftentimes healing will come in the body of the believer, the body of the believer by natural processes that God has built into our bodies. It's amazing that we are fearfully and wonderfully made, but these bodies are touched by sin that were created by God. It's amazing when you think about the body that we have that really it is self healing when you keep yourself uh, healthy. But sometimes healing comes when we seek medical help. What James is not saying in James chapter 5 is when you are sick, do not go to a doctor. Just call your pastor and he'll pray for you. Don't go to the emergency room. Just call the elders of the church and they'll pray for you. James is not saying that. Uh, We are fearfully and wonderfully made, but James 5 is not a directive to stay away from medical professionals or medical care. The Bible does not tell us to neglect wise medical advice. God has provided us with so many different options to keep us healthy and safe. Often Christians who choose to ignore the advice of medical professionals and refuse professional care are foolish, and they're taking Scripture verses out of context. And so God will allow our bodies to heal themselves, but also he also allows medical professionals to aid in that healing. Lastly, God may allow some people to be miraculously healed, and he may allow some people not to be healed. Ultimately, we understand and we know that God is good, God is wiser, and God is the great physician. Who heals? God. How? As he chooses and will never know his wisdom or the process of his choosing. Many believers, including myself, oftentimes have been disappointed as to why God does not miraculously heal the people that we pray for. But God is wise, and God has his thoughts and his ways are not our ways and his thoughts are our thoughts. And so what is proper when we're sick? Well, the Bible says here in verse 14 that when someone is sick, let them call the elders of the church and have them pray over him. Here we see prayer, we see anointing, we see healing, and we see forgiveness. Number one, it says here in verse 14, if any is sick among you, let him call for the elders of the church. It is a biblical thing for you to call the church when you are sick, all right? Uh, Because uh, Pastor Carr and myself, we both failed mind reading in college, all right? We don't know when you're sick if you don't let us know that you are sick. And I'm sure he's seen it a lot more than I have. Uh, people who come to church and they just get really frustrated because they were out of church for three weeks and no one came to visit them. You were sick? Yes, I was homesick. Well, did you let the church know? Well, no, I just assumed you were going to know. And when you have almost 200 people here on Sundays, you know, and a lot of conversations, it's hard to keep track of every single person, know what's going on in everybody's life. And so the Bible says here, is any sick among you? Let him call. All right, so it's biblical. For when you get sick, you call the church, okay? And you let the pastor know that you are not feeling well and you would like a visit, and we will stop by and we will visit you, okay? So the Bible says, let him call. This is not a scheduled part of the service. Let him call because we don't already know if you're sick. 
You've got to call and let us know. And I think this idea, let him call the elders of the church, this assumes that the sick ones already have a relationship with the church and the church body. And so when you're sick, you call the church, and it says you call the elders of the church. These are the pastors and the leaders of the church, not just the under-shepherd because the Lord is the chief shepherd, but other spiritual influences and leaders of the church. And I believe we have more than one person there because that way it's the healing, if God does heal, it's not on any one person. All right. If Dan said, hey, would you mind coming and praying with me, and I come and pray for Dan, all of a sudden Dan's miraculously healed, I'm like, whoa, whoa, I'm more spiritual than I thought. Look what I just did, you know. But if me and Pastor Carr and the deacons go over there and we, we lay hands on him or we anoint him and we pray over him, then it's no one person healing. We understand it's the Lord working through us. And so we call the elders of the church and let them pray over him. And that's in the presence of the person who is sick. And that is a private time. Uh, we're never going to have an anointing service here at the church, all right, where you come on Wednesday night and uh, we'll th- sprinkle some holy oil on you and then we'll be healed. No, this is a, a private thing. Now notice, let the one who is sick call the elders. It's not the, it's not the elders who seek out the sick person. It is the sick person who seeks out the elders. And so when this person is sick, they contact the elders and the elders will go to them privately and pray and anoint them. It's not a public thing, and that's why it's grossly unscriptural for a pastor to say, listen, if you are sick, you come and I will anoint you. That's not my call. That's your decision. And we'll see the implications and the importance of that decision in a moment. So it's not the elders seeking out those who are sick. It's the sick who are seeking out the elders. And so it says, you bring the elders, and then the Bible says here in verse 14, let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. Prayer is listed first because that is the priority. You pray, and then in verse 14, then you anoint them with oil. Now, there are three schools of thought with this oil. Why exactly do people anoint with oil? What exactly is so special about the oil? Some people think, number one, it's sacramental, that the oil is kind of magical, and the oil will help make you whole. Matter of fact, if you go online, you can buy... Magical essential oil. Not essential oils, but this healing oil that people try to sell because they believe the power is in the oil. Of course, you know this is not the case. The power is not in the oil. Healing power is always in the Lord. So there are some people who say it's sacramental, but it's not sacramental. There are some people who think that it's medicinal because in Scripture there are times when oil was used as medicine. Uh, like with the Good Samaritan in Luke chapter 10. The Bible says when the Samaritan saw the man laying... He went to him, bound up his wounds, pouring in oil and wine, and set him on his beast and brought him to an inn and took care of him. And so there are a number of instances in scriptures where people used oil as medicine. And so there are some people who believe that here you're just applying medicine or giving them the medicine that they need to keep them whole. And I do not think that's also the case either. I think scripturally that this is symbolic. It's in scripture. Oil is representative and indicative of the presence and the power of of the Holy Spirit of God. And as these men come to the sick ones and pray over them, they anoint and ask for the Holy Spirit's power in this person's life. When you go to the Old Testament and the New Testament, throughout the Bible, anointing with oil symbolizes consecration to God. Uh, When Israel wanted a king, Samuel anointed Saul. When Saul disqualified himself from being king, then Samuel anointed David. Uh, Moses anointed Aaron to, uh, be hit, to be really the mouthpiece of God and uh, his right-hand man. So he was consecrating him, setting him apart from all the people of Israel as God's mouthpiece and one of the leaders of the children of Israel. And so throughout the Bible, we see that oil symbolizes a special consecration to God. In Exodus, Luke chapter 4, Acts chapter 4, and also Acts chapter 10, a number of scriptures Now, anointing with oil is an external act of the body that accompanies and gives expression to the internal desire and disposition of faith to dedicate someone to God in a very special way. Much like baptism is an outward demonstration of an inward decision that's already made, in a way that oil is the same way. It's an outward demonstration of the heart of belief that you have inside. Matter of fact, anointing is so significant uh, that God's Messiah, the Hebrew word for Messiah, is anointing. Even Jesus Christ 
The word Christ means anointed one. And so Christ himself is the greatest manifestation of consecration to God in his perfect human form, his sacrificial death and victorious human resurrection from the grave. And so throughout the Bible, oil is used to separate and to consecrate and to set apart as holy. Jesus obviously was set apart as holy. So what does it have to do with those who are sick? Well, here in James chapter 5, as the elders pray, they are to anoint the sick person in order to symbolize that this person is being set apart for God's special attention and care. You, you don't really do this when you just feel under the weather and you just want to get back to church. Much like fasting, it's like an intensifier. When you're fasting and praying, you're showing God that you're serious about seeking His direction, seeking His will, seeking His heart, and so you sacrifice the physical for the sake of the spiritual. Anointing here, in a way, is also an intensifier. You're really showing God that you are setting yourself apart, and you're really trying to, to seek His direction and seek His healing in this. And so it's not something that you take lightly. It's not something I would take lightly, and frankly, if you ask me to do it, I don't know if I would even do it. Depending on the case, I'm sure it would be very specific. And so it's an intensifier there. And so as the elders pray, they are to anoint the sick person or to symbolize that this person is being set apart for God's special attention and care. So verse 14 says that the elders of the church come to the one who is sick. Let them pray over him first, anointing him second with oil in the name of the Lord. Now look at verse 15. And the prayer of faith shall save the sick. So is this person being healed because of the oil? No. They're getting healed because of the prayer of the faith. They're healed because Exodus 15, 26, God says, I am the Lord that healeth thee. Throughout biblical history, God has healed the sick in response to believing prayer. It's the prayer of faith that saves the sick. Who is praying? The elders. And it is the prayer of faith through their confidence that God hears and God answers. So again, was it in the oil? No. Was it the time alone with the elders and oil? No. Healing is because of the Lord. And since it's the Lord's, it's bound in His wisdom. And a prayer in the will of God, founded with faith in God, will always accomplish God's purpose. We could anoint and someone may not be healed. That may not be God's purpose. We're just saying this is a person that wants to set themselves apart for God's special attention and care, and we're just praying for God to do His will in this person's life. There are also those who say in verse 15, and the prayer of faith shall save the sick. So if, you, if the elder is right, and your heart is right, and the oil is good quality, then you will be saved because it says here, shall save the sick. That's a 100% statement. Well, Jesus also gave that in Matthew. We looked at that on Sunday. Ask, and it shall be given unto you. Seek, and ye shall find. In other words, when you do it God's way, according to God's word, his purpose will be accomplished. And so when the elders and the person who is praying, when they're in the will of God, God's will will be perfected, and God's will will be accomplished. Let me give you a way to pray for people who are sick. All right, Anybody who's sick, you should say something like this. Lord, will you use the sickness to draw this person to yourself? Because it may not be God's will for them to be healed. And if you feel, I, I'm just, I don't know what's going on. I just can't overcome this. You know, if it's a cancer or what it might be, and I feel like I need this anointing, we would pray that prayer. Lord, allow your will to be done in this person's life. His will may not be healing. His will may be to humble somebody or to work to somebody through this person. And so when we do it God's way, then we do know that the, the, the sickness, its purpose was fulfilled. And so again in verse 15, the prayer of faith shall save the sick. God's will will be done. His purpose will be completed and the Lord shall raise him up. And if he hath committed sin, they shall be forgiven him. If this person has committed sin, They've come to the conclusion that their sickness is a result of their sin. Perhaps they recognize and realize that a rebellion against God resulted in this sickness. And so what this person does perhaps is they humble themselves. That's calling for the elders. And they pray for God's forgiveness and God's filling. You know, when someone is under the chastisement of God, when someone is under God's judgment because of sin, the only remedy is humility and confession. 
if you are sick because it is a sin problem and you choose to hold on to sin in your life and you choose not to get it right with God and so God does afflict you to bring you back into the right way and you rebel against that, if you are in a sickness that is a chastisement of God, there is no earthly medicine that can heal you. The only healing will be humility and confession. And so perhaps this person here in James's mind is maybe this person realizes, you know, my sin has caused my sickness. And so if he has sinned, it will be forgiven because of his humility and his confession. Now, if you look at verse 16, we're not going to have time to dissect all of this. And so we're going to pick this up next week. But verse 16, confess your faults one to another and pray one for another that ye may be healed. The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. Really, this is natural transparency and humility with your church family. You are confessing your faults one to another. Why do we do that? Because the Bible says in Proverbs 28 and verse 13, He that covereth his sin shall not prosper, but whoso confesseth and forsaketh them shall have mercy. We understand through Bible teaching and Bible reading that this confession is not to a priest or a pastor, because a priest or a pastor cannot forgive sin. Only God can forgive sin. And you confess your sin as a point of accountability. It says again in verse 16, confess your faults one to another. Why do I need to confess my sin to you? Why do I need to confess my fault to you? Howell can't do anything about it. So why does he need to know my dirty laundry? Well, so he can keep me accountable. Hey, listen, I'm really struggling with my Bible reading. I need to stay in the word. So will you pray for me? That's me confessing my faults and him keeping me accountable. That's why we do this as a church family. It's transparency and it's accountability. You're not airing your dirty laundry. You're looking to improve and you're looking for accountability. Now, again, as we think about verse 16, when someone confesses, when someone's asking for healing, you ask, Lord, will you use the sickness to draw this person to yourself? Because ultimately, the physical sickness or limitations are insignificant in light of the spiritual problems that they may be facing. And the Bible says that the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. Now, I was surprised in my Bible study to realize that these are actually, this is actually one word. It's not effectual prayer, fervent prayer. It's one word that is described as effectual and fervent. In other words, it's effectually fervent praying. A very passionate, heartfelt cry that we will look at next week. How can we have effectual, fervent prayer? We'll talk about that next week. How do we confess our faults one to another and why do we do it? We'll talk about that next week. And so, but it is important to understand that it has the idea that it is effective to bring about the will of God and God works through the prayer of his people. And so tonight... As we pray for the sick on our list, and a majority of the things are physical needs, remember the physical need is secondary to the spiritual need. And God may be working on the physical to get attention and bring attention to the spiritual. And so it's not, we do pray for God's will to be done. I'm not saying no one on this list is going to be healed. All right, I'm not saying that. I am just saying that it is not God's will probably for everybody on this list to be healed of their sickness. Because we don't know why God has them in the situation they're in. And it might not be God at all. It just could be the consequence of poor choices. And so now they're feeling under the weather, and now they're, they're hurt, and now they're in the hospital, and now they're facing this disease because of something foolish that they did. And so what we do pray tonight is, God, where will your will be done in this situation? Will you bring about your best and your glory in this situation? That's what prayer is all about. Spending time with God and having God glorified in us and through us. And so be very mindful and intentional as you pray to the prayer list tonight. Uh, all sickness ultimately in general is because of sin. But not everyone is in a place of sickness because of their sin. Um, it may not be God's will for them to be healed. And if God chooses not to heal them, that's up to him. Sometimes healing comes through the body. Sometimes healing comes through medicine. Those are both very important. All right. So if you're sick, listen, go see your doctor. All right. 
uh, I've seen more times on, and then uh, a lot of times online where people have a child and the child gets sick and they just say, well, we're just going to pray for our baby. Hey, I'm all about prayer, but God gave us physicians for a reason. And so utilize them. And so, you know, don't be afraid to go to the doctor if you have to. Um, don't be so stubborn as to say, you know, I'm just going to pray that God's going to heal me. You know, maybe God's leading you to a doctor because you need medicine and you need something that your body does not produce and they can give you that. And so be mindful of that. And so be grateful for that as well. And so this evening, let's uh, be very mindful and intentional as we pray through our prayer list. And uh, the anointing aspect, again, we're not going to ever have a healing service here. All right, we're never going to have an anointing service here. Um, that's a very private thing between that person who wants to be anointed and the elders of the church. And uh, it's a private ceremony. It's a very serious ceremony, and God would not take that lightly. And I would say this in closing, that when you're asking for, an, like, hey, would you mind coming to my house? Or can I come into the office, and I really want you to pray and just anoint me with oil and just pray for God's will to be done in this sickness or this health situation? You are voluntarily separating yourself for God's attention and God's glory. So really what you're saying is, I want my life to be pleasing to God. I want my life to be used by God. And I am setting myself apart from what I used to do for the glory of God and for God to work in my life however he sees fit. Now remember, the Bible says, swear not. It's very important to God that you keep your word. Amen. It's very important to God that when you say you want him to do something, that you then in turn do something. And if you are going to say, I want to set my life apart for God's glory and for God's sake, and I think this will help me do that, and then if God heals you, and then you go right back to where you were before, that will bring chastisement and judgment by God. Because you said you want to do one thing, and you broke that promise or commitment to the Lord. And so before you ever consider that, I would really look at your heart and say, is this something that I can sustain in my spiritual life? Is this a decision, if I really make this decision to be anointed, can I follow through in my heart and stay committed and stay dedicated to the Lord? It's a very serious thing. And so um, I hope it brings some clarity uh, to the idea of anointing. If not, then come see me. Uh, or better yet, see Pastor Carr. All right, he'll answer all the questions. No, I'm just kidding. If you have any questions, uh, you can come see me and we'll talk it out. I'll talk a little more slower and we'll go in more detail about some things. Um, but 10 times out of 10, the anointing you see on TV is unbiblical. I even believe it's partly demonic. And so that's, that has no place in the church of God. And so um, I encourage you also um, to look at prayers of the Bible. This really is the only time we see anointing in the New Testament. And so go back to the Word of God, study it out for yourself, and see how the Holy Spirit directs you. All right? Let's have a quick word of prayer. Then we just missed to pray for our request this evening for about 10 minutes. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for your word, and we thank you so much for allowing us to be in, in your house tonight. And I pray that you help us this evening to understand these thoughts about anointing and even sickness. And I pray that you can remind us of these things as we pray for our request here in a moment. Uh, we do want to see our church family healed. We do want to see them uh, back in church because you brought them here for a reason. People are members of our church so that they can join us in fulfilling the Great Commission. You brought them to us so they can use their gifts to better the body of Christ and to be a benefit to other families in our church. And so we know they're here for a purpose. And so we miss them when they're not here and we need them when they're not here. But Father, I pray that you can always help us be mindful that you may have a greater cause or greater thought process than we do. And so help us always, always, always be submissive to you and your will. Help us never give up in praying. Help us always be effectually fervent in praying. But Father, help us always be submissive and humble as we do pray. Father, we thank you so much for this church and the church that prays together. Pray you keep us unified and keep us focused on you and your glory. In your son's name we pray. Amen. I'm glad you're here tonight. Let's take about 10 minutes or so and ask God uh, for his wisdom and will and the requests that are mentioned on Sunday and tonight. And we'll have our final hymn in about 10 minutes.
Let's all stand one more time tonight. Number 440 in our songbooks. Number 440, a shelter in time of storm. Just that first verse and chorus as we stand and sing. Number 440 tonight. The Lord's our rock, in Him we hide, a shelter in the time of storm. Secure whatever will be tied, a shelter in the time of storm. Oh, Jesus is a rock in a weary land, a weary land, a weary land. Oh, Jesus is a rock in a weary land, a shelter in the time of storm. Amen. I'm glad you're here today. Brother Dan, would you please come forward to the front and close the service in prayer? Brother Dan's a great testimony to the power of prayer. So grateful he's out of the hospital and doing well tonight. Don't forget Sunday, if you can, join us Sunday night after church for the service. Be here at 6 o'clock for evening service. Then stay for some volleyball, some uh, cornhole. Bring some board games if you want to. Have a good time of fellowship together. Just let's spend time together as a family. Brother Dan, please close the service in prayer. appreciate you. Dearly Father, I come to you now, Lord, I thank you for letting us all come to the worship show today and be safe, Lord. Lord, I want to thank you for being with, taking care of me, Lord, and helping me get better. Lord, I pray that you would be with the families of Texas, Lord, who are mourning now the loss of their kids, Lord. I pray that you would be with them, Lord, and give them peace. Lord, I pray that you would be with the mission in a couple of weeks, Lord, that you let them have a safe trip there, a safe trip while they're there, Lord, and a safe trip home, and I pray that so would be safe, Lord. I ask that your will be done, Lord. I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.